Hey, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this really exciting webinar with John DeJulius. Uh, he is joining us today to talk about his new book, The Relationship Economy, but I'd like to just introduce him first. So questions for you. Have you ever wondered how some companies become brands customers can't live without? Do you think it is possible to make price irrelevant? Our next presenter is going to tell us exactly how to do both. Uh, John DeJulius has written three best-selling business or books on customer service with a fourth on its way coming out on October 8th. So you guys are getting a sneak peek at what's gonna be inside the relationship economy and how important that is to understanding what's inside of there for your business. Um, and the DeJulius group is the group that that John DeJulius has, and they are focused on creating a customer service revolution. And I think some of you guys have seen our emails coming out talking about the customer service revolution conference taking place in Cleveland coming up here in September. So John will be one of the speakers there. So hopefully you'll enjoy this webinar and there'll be more information about that event at the end of this webinar. But just to give you some context, John consults with some of the best customer service companies in the world. So I'll let you guys just eyeball some of those brands there. And I think maybe some of you have heard of some of those people, some of those brands, and some of us might even have spent a little money in one of those places this morning. I know I did. Hmm. Uh, and John comes to us with a background in building his own business and being very successful there. So John Roberts Spa is a chain of spas and with salons located in the Cleveland area with over 20 of them. And honestly, his success in this area is what led him into being known as a customer thought leader and actually starting the, the, the Julius group. And the webinar today is going to give us insight into this relationship economy. Again, this book is due out October 8th, so we are getting a sneak peek here. So I hope all of you enjoy it. And John, thank you so much for joining us. I would like to hand it over to you. Thank you, Christine. And I'm so excited uh, to be doing this. We've been talking about this and uh, I love what, uh, you guys are about, and I know uh, your members are passionate. So yes, this is one of my first presentations ever on my new book, so I am excited. So welcome to the relationship economy. And I wanna hit it hard. Today's illiterate are those who have an inability to truly make a deep connection with others. And I'm sure there's a lot of people nodding their head to this. There's a seismic shift happening today. Technology is changing the world, and not always for the better. For all the benefits it's bringing to business, it's coming at a significant cost. And the cost is weaker human relationships that are vital to the customer experience, employee experience, and personal happiness. And, and I want to make sure I preface that I love technology, and technology is not the enemy. I, I totally believe there's a, a, a significant place for it but it, 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 it can't eliminate the human experience. So the robots are coming by 2025. There'll be more machines in the workforce than humans. That is scary. And there's the commoditization of technology. You know, years ago, if you came out with an advancement, an innovation, that could give you 18 months to three years of a competitive edge. Well, now all our advancements is typically in technology and that's the easiest thing to replicate. I mean, looking at, you know, you, you may not know it, but these are two different apps, right? Um, I made them black and white and I bet you don't know which one's which. Uh, and now I put it back in color and because of the color, you can tell which one's which, but it just shows. Anything you come out in technology can be replicated, you know, overnight. We are entering or we're in the midst of the touch screen age. And this includes baby boomers as well as millennials. And for, uh, you know, although many think of the younger generation as being the, the most tech savvy, virtually no one has been left out. Members of every age group now use smartphones, social media, iPads, and computers. And these devices are a necessary part of our lives. Although they make things easier and more useful, um, when they're overused, 
um, their interactions and more importantly, our emotional states decrease. So, you know, we have, as a result, we have significantly fewer face-to-face -face interactions. And when we lack those interactions, our people skills begin to erode. Uh, Dr. Manfred Spitzer said, uh, negatively impacting human, the human, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, this can negatively impact humans. I'm, I'm screwing this up. His quote is, when you use computer, you outsource your mental activity. The more time you spend with screen media, the less social skills you will have. So, research has shown that the social engagement and meaningful relationships are associated with living longer and improving lives. We probably know that. But they also said a lack of social relationships is equivalent to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. That's pretty scary. The single biggest factor contributing to where each of us are today remains the relationship we have acquired over our lifetime. I doubt anyone would disagree with that. So we are relationshiply disadvantaged in, 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 in several ways. This is why this is so important. Generational decline in people's skills, the digital disruption, business building high-tech, no-touch experiences. We have younger leaders than we ever had before. And finally, there's a lack, to, lack of soft skill relationship building, meaning at home, when they're not getting it, they're not getting it at school, and most businesses don't offer it. And if you're a business that wants to flourish, this is the key part. Your, your, your employees aren't gonna have it, you're gonna have to teach it. And that's what we're gonna address in the rest of uh, this uh, webinar. So there's a term, digital dementia. And what that means is doctors have discovered that heavy users of digital devices experience cognitive and memory problems similar to people who've had sustained severe brain injury. That's crazy to me. And you know, one of my favorite speakers and authors, Simon Sinek said, everything you want today, you can have instantly. Instant, gratific instant gratification, except job satisfaction and strength of relationships. There ain't no app for that. Love that quote. Relationships are the div biggest differentiator in customer and brand loyalships. Uh, loyalty. Relationships are at the center of all we do. Despite all the advances in technology and the presence of social media in our world, the single, single biggest factor contributing where we are is how we've acquired, you know, relationships. And, and not net, but the, 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 not networking, but the people in our network. And what's the, what's the cost? So technology is changing the world, but the cost is weaker human relationships that are so vital to customer experience and employee experience and happiness. And focusing strictly on the digital experience will eliminate customer loyalty and emotional connections to the brand. So, the answer is, we have to, organizations now need to reinvent the business model to marry digital and human experiences in the best way possible. Those who understand that human touch is the most important part of any experience, especially a great customer experience will flourish. Success is about creating and building human connections. So that brings us up to the relationship economy, building stronger customer connections in the digital age. And that is, um, that will be out October 8th. But what is the customer, uh, what is the relationship economy? It's the primary currency is a connection and trust among employees, customers, and vendors that cr create significantly more value in what we sell. It's about building a culture that recognizes the importance of each individual and of making everyone part of community that's working towards something bigger community that makes them feel cared for. And ultimately, these relationships and connections help make price irrelevant. So this is what we do. This is what the DeJulius Group does. We help make price irrelevant. And some people you know, think that's unrealistic. Well, making price irrelevant doesn't mean that you can raise your prices 25% and not lose existing or potential customers. What making price irrelevant does mean 
is based on the experience your brand consistently delivers, your customers have no idea what your competition charges. So, Christine talked about that. My first business that we opened about 27 years ago is a chain, well, it has grown into a chain of salons. Now, we're in the Cleveland area, so if you're not from the Midwest, you may not relate to uh, what a woman's haircut in the Midwest is. Uh, the average is about $32. Now, if you're in Miami, New York, LA, it's, it's five times that, maybe 10 times that for the average. Our least expensive for a woman's haircut, for, for one of our newer hairdressers that's gone through training and just went on the floor, is $50. And we have several hairdressers, well over $100. And we're the busiest, okay? Um, and however, you know, a few years ago, a salon four doors down from one of our location put this sign in their window. We do $10 haircuts. And my staff freaked. They freaked out. They thought we were gonna go out of business. And they wanted to start running promotions and discounts. And so I had to, you know, back them off and say, listen, well, let's focus, let's play that game. Let's focus on what our experience is. Let's focus on what we say we deliver and let's improve it. Let's be more consistent. Let's add to it. And then we put this sign in our window. We fix $10 haircuts. And you'll be disappointed to know that within about eight months, that other salon went out of business, right? That was, you know, they're, they're, they, they, were, they were reaching. They were, they were just trying anything to stay in business. So the point to that is we choose not to compete in price wars. We like to compete in experience wars. And my favorite quote to all of this is discounting is the tax you pay for being an average. And if that hurts, it's supposed to, right? We don't want to discount. We don't want to get in price wars. We want to compete in experience wars. So there are five keys to relationships, and they're not all innate. A lot of them can be taught, believe it or not, okay? Being authentic, right? Being authentic, being curious. You have to be a, 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 a detective when you're, when you're talking to other people. Okay, you have, to, you have to be a great listener, and we're gonna talk about techniques. That doesn't come innately. That being a great listener goes against how we're genetically, you know, pre-coded to be. And it's not a bad thing, it's just, it's just, it's our lives, it's, it's happening to us. You have to have incredible empathy, empathy, and that can be taught. And then finally, you have to have a love for people. Now, not everyone will have that. And that's probably the big one that, you know, will, will, it has to show up um, it, during the interview process. I firmly believe and know firsthand that the first four can be taught. It's better if people have it coming in, but you won't find a lot of people to have those. But if your training has those, the, the, the fifth one, the, the, the genuine love for other people, that has to be in there when you get them. Okay, so... Leaders are getting younger. Almost 40% of, of us in the U.S. workforce have a boss that's younger than them. That's crazy. That's the, the highest it's ever been. As a result, digital intelligence is up and emotional intelligence is down because of that. Chip Conley says it best. Power is cascading into young like never before because of our incre increasing reliance on digital intelligence. Yet we expect these young digital leaders to somehow miraculously embody the relationship wisdom we older workers have had decades to learn. It's hard to microwave emotional intelligence. I love that quote. Those who understand, oh, sorry, it went too fast. Those who understand that the human touch is the most important part of any experience, especially a great customer experience, will flourish. Success is about creating and building human connections. And what CEOs say about relationships, when asked where, if, if relationships, and we're talking about all relationships, to vendors, to employees, to customers, all significant business relationships, 89% said, CEOs said, they were most important 
to the company's success. Yet only 5% have a specific strategy to develop and strengthen. That is pretty, you know, eye-opening. And there is an, an empathy crisis, all right? Just in general, why? Employees do not know what world-class is. In every industry that's listening to this webinar, watching this webinar, think about your frontline employee and who your customer is. And in, in, in almost age-wise, you know, uh, uh, socially, economically, where they live, what they drive. Employees, I didn't. I, I doubt Christine did. I doubt anyone in here. We did not grow up, you know, getting a Mercedes Benz when we turned 16, flying first class, uh, staying at five-star resorts. Yet the moment we got our first jobs, our, our fifth jobs, we were expected to give that type of experience to those types of customers, patients, tenants, clients, whatever we may call them. And it's not realistic. The second reason, um, you know, well, it kind of goes with that, you know, so they don't know what world-class is because they didn't visit. They're not the customer from the age standpoint. The, the valet driver at the Ritz does not drive a car close to what he's parking all day. Uh, my hairdressers, you know, are, are in their mid twenties servicing wealthy, you know, clientele in their forties and fifties, right? There's a disconnect. Doesn't mean we change who we hire, but we have to make sure they understand what it's like to be their customer. Um, and this is, none of this is the employee's fault. Companies rarely have the employees look at from the customer perspective. Another lack of empathy as we compare ourselves to the rest of our industry. So I hear this so often. We're the best in our industry. Well, a lot of industries aren't that great, so that's nothing to brag at. But here's something else. In most businesses, if I'm your client, okay, it's kind of irrelevant how good you are in your industry. Because if I'm your client, I don't hang up. I don't leave your business and then go to your nearest competition. I don't need your competition because I'm using you. But what I do do is I have other experiences with other companies, totally outside of your industry. And that's what I start comparing you to. And finally, employees become numb. We all be, and none of this, again, I can't stress it enough, is the employee's fault. It's the company's fault or the company's obstacle challenge that they have to attack. We all look at, work with a big healthcare system, many. And, you know, they refer to their customer as 201B. 201B means room 201, bed B. No, that's my mother, right? And I'm not ripping on the healthcare. We're all guilty of it. I have a keynote in, in Chicago tomorrow, right? We all, order number 196, table number 82. And, you know, those are ways where we start forgetting that this is a, a, a human being that is critically dependent on us. So let's talk about how we fix this. We gotta start with relationships 101, and this may seem basic, but it's not anymore. It really isn't. The art of listening. If you ask a question and don't ask two or three follow-up questions, odds are you weren't listening to the answer. A good listener becomes invisible. They make the respondent the centerpiece. The best way to persuade someone is with your ears. Can you keep quiet for 18 seconds? Longer than 18 seconds. Professionals say that is the limit to most experts. And I'm guilty of that too. They started with doctors and said that the doctors, you know, could not keep quiet longer than 18 seconds. But then they took it to other industries. And anyone that's an expert, which is most of us at what we do, when someone comes to me and says, I'm having a problem with customer experience in my company, whatever they're going to say, I've heard it a million times. So what we tend to do is we want to like end their sentence, jump in, start telling them the answer, right? Because we know where they're going with that. And that's, you know, not a good listening skill. That's a, a very hard thing for me to do too. You can't be listening if you're talking. Never miss a good chance to shut up. Don't be a sponge. Be a trampoline. A sponge 
it, it is 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 uh, a trampoline. I'm sorry, someone you could bounce ideas off of, rather than a sponge that's just absorbing your ideas. Okay, so so we sometimes think we should be a sponge, but they say the experts is you want to be a trampoline. You want to listen and then ask more compelling questions. So some conversations never and always that may or may not seem obvious, but we got to make it part of our training. And we got to our customer facing employees, never multitask. And this is something that, you know, even as leaders, right? If an employee comes to me and wants to talk, I need to put my cell phone in the drawer and look at them and turn away from my monitor or anything else. Never ask a question because you're dying to answer it yourself. And these also work in, you know, our, our personal lives too. Never ask a question to hijack the answer. That's another tough one. Never finish the other person's sentence. That kind of goes back to, can you keep quiet longer than 18 seconds? Here's a really good one that, uh, well, it's not good, but here's one that when I was reading the research, I found that I'm totally guilty of. Um, never steal someone's thunder, okay? So I never did this with bad intentions. So let's say I, I'm talking to Christine, and you know, Christine may be a, a, a customer or an employee, and I, I, I know she was off last week. And I say, Christine, what'd you do on vacation? And she says, I took, uh, me and my husband took our two little girls to Disney World, first time ever. And she's so excited, she wants to tell me all about it. And I might you know, jump in and say, oh my God, I love Disney, we've been there like you know, 15 times. And, 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 and subconsciously not meaning to do that, I'm thinking that that's creating a, a, a something we have in common, but obviously that just steals uh, Christine's thunder because what can someone possibly tell someone about Disney that's been there 15 times? So just ask me, oh my God, tell me about it. Did your little girls love it? Where did you stay? Um, it's a hard one, hard one to do. Some conversation always. You know, we talked about this, always remove any distraction possible. Always demonstrate your full attention. Love this one. Listen with your eyes. Love that. Listen with your eyes. Always be an active listener. Ask questions. Ask fascinating, probing questions, follow up questions, and even more questions, and then be silent and let them speak. Some more conversation always. Always show empathy and support in a non judgmental way. Show patience. Let the other person speak their piece, finish their thought, feel heard. Wait two seconds before responding to process what you heard, and you'll see why in a little bit um, how important that is. And always be in a learning mode. Everyone has something to teach. And then finally, the last conversation always. Always make the person feel that they're the centerpiece. Always collect forward and document it. That will make sense very shortly. And always commit to a follow-up when it's called for or an action plan. You know, Christine asked me if there's any chance she can have Labor Day weekend off, right? And, and I'm, I will um, check on that and I will let you know, or obviously with a customer, um, you know, commit to a follow-up and stick to it. And, and, and under promise, if, if you know you can get this answer by the end of the day, tell them you're going to have it by the end of tomorrow because we will always have fires that come up um, emergencies. So I'd much rather tell you I'm going to be able to get back to you by the end of tomorrow and hopefully surprise you and get back to you by the end of the day. So all this helps us become the brand customers can't live without. And I love using this metaphor. Are you in your client's bomb shelter? Okay. So a bomb shelter, as, 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 as some of us uh, may remember, but, but it, it, it's a metaphor that uh, everyone has a, a, a mental bomb shelter, right? If we were gonna get bombed and we had a, a, a personal and professional bomb shelter, we only fit like a few people, right? That personal, you're taking your spouse, your kids, whomever. But your professional bomb shelter only fits three people. Are you one of them? And, and where the business that your, your customer, your client can't fathom life without you. That they don't care if some other, you know, uh, vendors are gone tomorrow because they could probably find someone cheaper, but they could not fathom life without you. Um, we've always heard of uh, always uh, ABC, but maybe not this way. 
Um, it used to be known as always be closing, always be connecting. And build relationships. Stop networking. Social capital is a result of long-term continuous relationship building and one of the most powerful resources a person can have. You build social capital by always putting the other person's goals first and foremost in every relationship. So how can you be a partner? Your clients can't live without. Love what you do and make it obvious. Get to know your customer personally and professionally. Be more committed to the success of your customer than they are, right? Lose sleep at night over their problems. Even they may not relate to, you know, what you do. And, you know, don't share how you can help them until you've completely understood what their goals and problems are. So a few more. Make sure your clients never meet anyone smarter at what they do than you are. And I'm, I'm talking about it at your expertise. Be honest and transparent. What that means is go ugly early. If it's bad news, tell them. Don't delay. Tell them right away. And be a resource broker. Find out what is important to your client and in their business, their top three goals, and help them. And that may have nothing to do with what you do. So about a year ago, I did a, a TEDx talk and it's titled, Meet as Strangers, Leave as Friends. And I, it's nine minutes, nine minutes and 30 seconds, and I strongly encourage you to watch this. Show this to your kids, okay? Because I truly believe there is no skill, maybe other than the skill of breathing in oxygen, okay? That's the only one I, I, I will argue with. But other than that, there is no greater skill that each of us can work at every day that will have a more significant impact to our success, our personal and professional life, than the ability to build an instant rapport with others. And that you know, is a customer, an acquaintance, a coworker, an employee, or total stranger, yet, how important that skill is, it's not taught anywhere. It's not taught in school. It's not taught at home. And it's certainly not taught in businesses. And for the businesses that are successful, that are owning the relationship economy, they have incorporated this. So how, where do you start with this? When you're teaching your employees, when you're teaching your children, when you're reminding yourself. Well, the first place is that we have to remember that every person we come in contact with has an invisible sign above their head that says, make me feel important, right? Even your kids, when you get home from work. So I got to believe that most, if not everyone will agree with, with what Stephen Covey said here. People don't listen with the intent of understanding. They listen with the intent of replying, right? Everyone understands that. So scientists studied the human brain and they found that it took the human brain or it takes the human brain a minimum of 0.6 seconds to formulate a response to something said to it. Then they studied hundreds, thousands of conversations and found the average break between people talking was 0.2 seconds. How can we be responding to another person in one third the time our brains will allow us to? Well, obviously, we formulate our responses long before the other person um, is done talking, right? We're just waiting for them to come up for air. So I love to ask, you know, what can we do? What should we do when we're speaking to others? You shut your mouth when you're talking to me. One of my favorite movies, right? Um, or listen, right? Listen. And, and, and so um, the greatest gift we can give others is the gift of our attention. And we do have to pause. We do have to, make, and listen, there is times when I'm in my car, in you know, my driveway, and I gotta take an extra 10 minutes before I can get out of the car because I need to unwind because I know I can't go inside and give that gift to my family. Right. Same thing, you know, if I just hung up and, and was getting screamed at by a, uh, a client. Right. And I have a meeting with another client, a phone call or uh, an employee. 
right? If I'm not ready to give this gift, I, I can't cheat anyone. So I love to ask audiences, companies, employees, how many of you feel that you're great at building an instant rapport with others? And typically, every hand goes up. I, I, I have to count the hands that don't go up. Okay, everyone is convinced they're really good at that because you know they're good conversations. But being a good conversationalist does not mean you're good at building a, a rapport or a relationship. Okay, because you could have met someone last night at a party at Starbucks this morning, you know, whoever, and, and spent 15, 20 minutes with them. But that 15, 20 minutes could have been about you, right? We're genetically, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm missing the word though, but, but uh, um, coded, that's not the word I'm looking for, but, but coded to be preoccupied with our own life, right? It's my flight that sat on the tarmac last night. It's my client that's threatening to, you know, uh, fire us. It's my son that got in trouble. And, and that's just the way it is. So we have to battle those urges or I want to, you know, step over, you know, uh, Christine in a conversation and tell her about my timeshare in Orlando, Disney, right? So we have to step over those urges. So this is how anyone can prove to me, even my three boys, if you should meet them, they know um, they will have to, you know, pass this test. If anyone has a conversation with anyone for, for 90 seconds to 90 minutes, they have to know two or more things of the other person's Ford, F-O-R-D. If you know two or more things of the other person's Ford, you not only built a rapport, you own the rapport, you own the relationship. Because to each of us, our own Ford is the most passionate thing that we have. It's what gets us talking fast, right? It's what gets us excited, our voice cracking. F, family, are they married? Do they have kids? How old are their kids? occupation. What do they do? How long they've been doing it? Who do they do it for? Recreation. This might be everyone's biggest one. What do they like to do with their free time? They're runners, right? They, they, they run marathons. They coach little league. They take yoga and dreams. What's on their bucket list? What's their dream vacation? What do they want to do next in life? So when you focus on other people's Ford in any conversation, right? It keeps you off yourself and you're collecting what people are most passionate about. Now, not every client interaction calls for uh, four, right? I mean, you know, we have a call center that books appointments and, and these are the desk pads that everyone, our clients and, and myself, uh, you know, when we're talking to someone over the phone, um, do and, and collect. But you know, if you're calling to schedule an appointment, I don't want my call center reps, which are really called uh, uh, relationship uh, 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 representatives, um, I don't want them asking for it, right? That'd be like a stalker checklist, right? But they don't have to. You see, when someone calls in and says, I need to change my three o'clock on Wednesday because my daughter's soccer team made it to districts, clients overshare. But you want to have these Ford customer intelligence pads near you everywhere so you can capture that stuff. So now when she checks in on Thursday for appointment, the hostess can say, how did your daughter's soccer team do? So, you know, collecting and keeping these. Every, you know, we use Salesforce. I have three businesses, right? I have the salons. Um, I have the DeJulius Group, which I spend all my time in. And then we have a nonprofit. Every, every database out there, can be customized and every client we've ever worked with has been able to add Ford to their database. It's real easy. Most databases are customizable, right? So if you're a B2B and over the, you know, it, it, that's easy. You know, I could see where Christine's from, right? I can see that she has two daughters, you know, from anything I've collected or her most recent purchases or our last communication with anyone. So you can start off and end those conversations with that. Have you ever bought a new car so excited because you never saw it in that model, that color, until an hour later? That's all you see, right? Um, well, did eight other people have the same idea as you today and go out and buy that same color model? No. Truth is, you know, those, those cars have always been there. But the difference is your mind is now primed 
to see what's always been there. So having four tools, whether it be in your database, a pad, whatever those things are, even we, you know, go out personally, like I said, my, my friend, my, my sons have to collect for it because I don't want them to be talking about themselves. So if they meet an adult, they know when they come over, I'm going to be asking them what did they find out about the adults, um, our staff. We collect Ford with everyone we come in contact. It's not the creepy Ford, right? It's the professional Ford. But, and it's even a good use for social. I, you know, my, uh, my two older sons are at the dating age. Now, in the professional arena, right, we, 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 we try to keep Ford on the other person. Now, it is important to share a little bit um, to create that relationship. It has to be a two-way street. Uh, but for the most part, we try to keep the Ford on the other person. In, in the professional relationship. And this especially works for your employees. You better know your employees Ford, what's important to them. However, I like to call this Ford in the personal uh, uh, area, uh, kind of a self-absorbed monitor. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you could go out to dinner with, you know, another couple and, you know, the, 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 you know, my case, the, the husband I've never met before because the, the wives are um, um, friends at work or something. And, you know, I could afford him, well, I will afford him, you know, but after an hour, if I can tell you everything, you know, imagine about you, but he can't tell you one thing about me because he didn't bother to ask, that might, you know, say something to me that that's not, not someone I want to invest more time in. And I tell my, my, my sons that too, if they go out and they meet a, you know, a, 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 a girl afford them, right? And they're really good at that. I go, but if they never afford you back, that might tell you that that might not be someone who's too interested in, uh, you know, anything but talking about themselves. So it's a good uh, uh, self-absorbed monitor in a personal setting. Even in, in my world, um, and that's me in the lower right, I don't look happy there. I have uh, uh, what we call RBF. Okay, so... Uh, even in the, uh, uh, our conference calls, we can't do conference calls. We have to do Zoom calls with our clients. And they're so good because you see the person, right? And you, you usually see things behind them. And it might be a diploma or a beach. And you talk about, hey, where is it? And I see, you know, is that your family? You know, you have two little girls, whatever that may be. And, and you're, you're finding out for it just from visually. But you're also seeing that, you know, he's a really nice guy. And if I was smiling like I should be, uh, hopefully he would see the same thing, right? Now, the other thing is, here's the real reason why I do it, okay? Truth be told, if I don't, if I'm not on Zoom and I'm having a conference call with anyone, I could easily get distracted and see that my phone's blowing up, right? Or, you know, get, to, and I could start missing. So the Zoom video call keeps me honest, focused, listening with my eyes, you know, and 100% and attentive. My favorite quote to this, and it pops up every day at 6 a.m. on my cell phone, as a reminder is, act as if today is the day you will be remembered for how you treat others. Act as if today is a day you'll be remembered for how you treat others. And the last thing I want to share with you, and I'll open it up back up to Christine and uh, any questions the group, is my two favorite words is give more. Love these. If, if you want to build long-term sustainable relationships, personally and professionally, you got to give more. We live in a very cynical society, and the deal is... Our agreement says, right, that the one side has to do A, B, and C, and I got to do X, Y, and Z. However, most people wait, and they make sure the other side, the other company, the other person does what, you know, their part is, and then they do what they're supposed to do. And what I, what I try to do, what I teach my sons, what I teach my staff, what I teach my clients is do your part first. Do X, Y, and Z first. Um, and, and throw in W, even though W wasn't part of it, even though they weren't expecting, always give more than it, it expected, right? Give more to your company, give more to your coworkers, give more to your customer, give more to your significant other, give more to the stranger. That means if you borrow someone's pickup truck to move furniture, you give them that pickup truck with more gas 
and cleaner than how they gave it to you. Find ways to give more in every relationship and it will come back to you tenfold. Okay, Christine, back to you. Hey, John, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I found some of your stats alarming a little bit, especially the, if people are socially isolated, uh, it's, it's equivalent to if they're smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is just mind boggling to me. Right. Uh, which which just proves right that like if you are able to build a relationship they can they become even more loyal than i i think along like in the 50s right like everybody small business everything was built on relationships and that was just kind of a given and at this point it's not and if you can show that you're invested in them and interested in them it really I, I think everyone's burdened with anxiety and stress. And when they have someone that they can trust or someone that's interested in them, it really helps ease the burden. And it seems like as a business that maybe we can't do that for people because we're not like their friends. But I, I think that that's not true anymore. And, and I would love to hear what you think, you know, to the group and to, to John, I feel like, people just want to be seen anymore and i think the bigger sometimes the bigger the city or the more people they're surrounded by the more lonely some people even are and just um spending that a little bit additional time to know them makes a huge difference i mean what what do you think john no i think you're hundred right i think compared to you know all the other experiences we're getting right that that we have you know, the, the apps and the one click and all of those things, which are great, but you yeah. know, I'm dying to be a person to someone and, yeah. you know, it really makes the few stand out and be memorable. And, you know, the emotional connection is going to, you know, drive customer loyalty more than any gadget we can ever put out there. Yeah. Interestingly, right before this call, or before this webinar, I had a call with one of our, our business partners. And so he's going through, they're going through like building through out their strategy and, and, and looking at ways to, to market a little bit more. So he went back to his clients to ask them a few questions about, you know, what was your business need and how did you find us? And, and what did we do really well? What are we not doing well? And he found that they said to him, Hey, you know what you were really good at and what your team is really good at is just, you build relationships with us and you figure out what it is we need and that's just nobody else does that and i thought that's amazing it's like two the, the same message basically within an hour that i hear about how ridiculously important that is to businesses and so i think for me and and maybe for some of you guys listening because and if you want to chime in please jump on chat or in the q a section to contribute or, or add your two cents here but um, I just think that we have a lot of people here who are very experienced. Some of them are excellent at building relationships. You know, they've been doing this a long time. Maybe they have experienced some of that five-star service and are able to demonstrate that, but they have team members who maybe aren't doing that or maybe younger staff that they're having trouble kind of communicating that to. And, and you went through a good list, John, of things that they can think about or things that they should be doing, but how can they what's the best way do you think to get that conversation going with their team and get their buy-in and keep that conversation top of mind while they're serving their customers and clients so obviously the first thing is we got to start getting it as as part of employee training and anytime you roll out anything to your existing generation of employees it has to be replicated for orientation right because I mean, you could roll out this great training program today this week that raises everyone's service aptitude and and relationship skills um but as you know that you're going to be adding employees constantly you got to make sure it's replicated and put in to the new hire um and then you know so, so teach them and, and role playing going through a lot of this information talking about examples of of successes and wins both in your industry but you know in in your company and I guarantee you, you the best relationship builders in your companies are, are the highest at sales, resign rates, you know, whatever your, your key performance indicators are. So you already have your best practices. We've got to replicate that. And you know, too many people today think their expertise 
is what people are coming to. And, 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 and they become arrogant, right? From doctors to consultants. I'm, I'm a consultant. I'm, I'm throwing myself under the bus to, to lawyers, to accountants, to IT, to anything, right? Hairdressers. They've been doing it a long time and they, it, we start, you know, you know, getting to the point where, you know, people, you know, are, are, are lucky to have me working with them. Well, listen, all the, 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 the professionals I just listed, there's a lot of smart, you know, people out there that do the same thing. And if, if it's financial brilliance or whatever topic, uh, um, you know, subject we're talking about, um, if that's all you have, that's a commodity. Because my lawyer who, or my accountant who saved me $25,000 last year in taxes on, on some loophole that he found, I'm pretty sure any quality accountant, accountant I would you know, hire would know that same tax loophole, okay? So that by itself is a commodity. So, so we have to remember that, you know, people do business with people they like. And, you know, so one of the easiest exercises when you get people together is, is say, who is a brand you can't live without, right? Um, you know, if, if I took, you know, if I could take one business away from you, and, and Christine, I'm going to take one business away from you um, that you could never do business with again. Now, before I do that, I'm going to give you one chip. And that one chip means you can protect one company, right? So Christine, who would that be? for you that I couldn't, and after you protect that, I could take any of the other ones. And, and the way I'm gonna uh, uh, decide is, Christine, I'm gonna look at your personal checkbook, your personal credit cards, and see where you spend your money, right? And then I'm gonna decide from that who, what company I'm gonna take away with, right? So what would be yours, Christine, that you would protect that you just wouldn't allow me to take away? Oh, that I would wanna keep doing business with? Yeah. <sighs> That is an excellent question. You know what? It would be my children's daycare. Okay. All yeah. right. So good. And, and so this is a, it's a great exercise to do with employees. And you'll hear typical things like, you know, Apple, um, Starbucks, um, Amazon, you know, and, 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 and some that have, you know, meaning to them. And then the next question is why? And all the answers are the same, right? And, and you know, the trust. And typically, not typically, never will you hear it because they're the cheapest. I guarantee you, your, children, your children's daycare are not the cheapest. I, I guarantee, Christine, you oh. could find cheaper daycare, right? Oh, yeah. It's never the price. But it's what they've done emotionally with your children and you for the trust that you're, you're okay writing a, a more expensive check. So when you do that exercise and you, you find the five or six things in common that everyone said, why she said Apple, why he said Starbucks, why the other person said Amazon, and it was never priced. Well, then you, you take those five or six things that we all said about the company we can't live without, and you, you start doing an audit on yourself. Are we doing those things? How well are we at you know, building that relationship and all the other things that people would, would come up with? So you know, that's, that's you know, uh, another piece to it when you're, you're rolling it out. And then the final piece is the advertising piece of advertising for them to collect Ford. Um, so it's constantly in front of them. So they are focusing on collecting Ford instead of just you know, um, kind of oversharing about their life and you know, they, they got stuck in traffic today and you know, all the other things. Yeah, I, and I love that point because it's something that I think regardless of how long we've been interacting with people, we always have to focus on because we are wired and that is, to be thinking about ourselves, right? That, that we were designed that way to help save ourselves if there is a tiger coming after us, right? So we, we're always interested in, in what's going on in our lives versus someone else's. But I think that everyone the person you're interacting with life and your own life becomes that much more full if you're able to have those conversations and learn more about them. It's um, when you're always having the self-serving conversations, it's, it's just not as fulfilling. And I think part of it too, in, in presenting it maybe to team members is that what's in it for me, right? Because maybe they're like, well, I really don't care about that person's occupation or what their dreams are. But if they can understand that how much better they're going to be able to do their jobs and how much easier those conversations are going to be and how much more
more fulfilling they'll be if they do that and they have that what's in it for me because that's how we're wired i think that'll that helps people to want to take that opportunity to try and, and do that more just to see how it works yeah i mean listen it, it is a game changer for employee morale that you're giving them these tools that will not only help them at work but help them in their personal lives but they're going to go home more happy you know that they're going to go home you know building relationships with customers that gives them more fulfillment in their job instead of just being transactional order takers right chop chop get on get up and this isn't meant to you know slope and make them less productive right a lot of this can be done within the time frame they still have yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that even if it doesn't, and this is one of the things that certainly we work with some of our clients on and some of our students and understanding is even if it does take a little bit longer, the benefit on the other side is enormous. And if you do kind of like a financial cost of bad service audit or, or measurement, like looking at what, what the cost will be if you don't implement these things, it's actually a lot higher both from a stress perspective for your team members and for your bottom line. So it just completely makes sense to do it. And, uh, and I think that's the way a lot of people are trending, hopefully away from a focus on average handle time. If you're in a call center to, you know, more, you know, what's the experience? Did they get what they needed? Did you look proactively at the next question that they might have? understanding where they are in their life cycle, all that good stuff. So I think this is really relevant and valuable, John. And um, I didn't see any questions pop up in the chat, but if anyone has any now, please feel free to put something in there or in the Q&A. Let's see, I've got something that just came up from Ed. It says, how can you build a relationship with a client whose only communication is through email or team chat, no face-to-face -face or phone calls? Uh, Bi-weekly conference calls to discuss minor updates or concerns can to be addressed. I feel we are selling ourselves short with our client and not providing the service we are capable of. That's a great question, Ed. John, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't see much of a difference. Uh, I mean, obviously, when you have a call, it, it's slightly more, I mean, it is more personal. But, I, you know, in the email, you know, same thing. You can't be chop chop. So let's say your client, you know, asks a question, you know, a, a black and white yes or no question. The worst thing you can do is say, yes, 830, uh, two day, uh, you know, uh, it'll be there in two days, whatever that may be. You know, you know, hey, Ed, great to hear from you. Uh, how is summer going in Chicago? Right. I mean, you know where they're from. It's, it's not like you have to Google them. They're in your database. So you personalize it. Um, Absolutely, we can take care of that for you. And you know, you deliver the answer. Please don't hesitate. Uh, uh, reach out if I can answer anything else. Um, hope, you know, whatever. Happy Labor Day, happy 4th of July, whatever it is. So, you know, just sandwiching it with some Ford that you already know about them. I mean, you know where they're from, you know their last order, you know, anything about that, you know, it, it, so, so our never in, in electronic is we can't just respond. Um, we have to personalize it. We, you know, something little doesn't take us much longer, um, but that usually gets them to personalize it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good points. I mean, and it, and I, I agree. I think there's, there's definitely ways that you can customize that or engage through email, but I'm wondering, Ed, in your business, is there a way to also offer in addition to just the, um, the more transactional methods of chat or email to present to them maybe a quarterly face-to-face -face or a quarterly wow. Zoom update as part of it. Love that because you know you have some things that you know you think could help them, and it's yeah. not a necessary sales pitch, but you just want to learn more about their business, where they're going, you know, to educate yourself. Yeah, so if they're resistant, maybe offering it so that it's every quarter and then maybe they'll find that they actually love that format and some of these updates that you're doing um, can more regularly become turn into a face to face thing. But yeah, and, and, and your point is, is great, John, because sometimes it's not always they can't always do that, right? They can't always switch it to that format where they can see each other or hear each other's tone of voice. So those are all 
Excellent points. Let's see, you said you do your face-to-face -face, um, every three to four months. Okay, so that's good. So you do have that kind of incorporated now as well. So that's good. So what you're garnering out of those face-to-face -face meetings too, Ed, uh, you can, you'll be able to, I would imagine, incorporate into to some of the email communications and, and chats as well. So, um, and if they're not captured in your CRM, some of what comes up in those face-to-face -face meetings probably a uh, good opportunity to do that as well, just to add those little notes in there that align with the forward that John was talking about. Okay. Um, all right, if there are any other questions, feel free to type them in, but I did want to remind everyone, um, so the Customer Service Revolution Conference is coming up. It is in Cleveland, Ohio, September 10th through the 12th. So last year was the first year I was able to attend, and I will tell you, it's absolutely amazing. So I've been to a lot of customer service conferences, and I enjoy them, but this was probably the only one I said, I can't wait to go back next year. I think that the speaker lineup is amazing. The energy at the event is fantastic. And even if you don't get anything out of the speakers, which you will, I'm not saying you won't, but if you didn't, you would also see the way that the event is executed and the things that they do at the event will also demonstrate for you a customer experience at a level you haven't seen before. So if you can make that happen, if it's pretty um, easy to get to and can fit in your schedule. I know they ha you guys have a reception the night of the 10th, but the actual conference itself is all day the 11th and 12th. Uh, they have early bird registration going, I think through, well, at least another couple of weeks. So August 1st, um, right now it's $650 off the uh, regular price. So your members would get uh, 800 bucks off because whatever their price is, you get an additional 150 off. So uh, if it's 650, your CSIA members get uh, um, 800. Perfect. So I know you guys have seen some of this. You can also go to any uh, customerservicerevolution.com and just use the discount code CSIA2019. So anyway, I hope you guys found this of value. I love having you guys join in on our webinars and get any feedback from you all. If you're interested in this recording, I can definitely send that out. Certainly just send me an email to christine.churchill at serviceinstitute.com. We'll also pop it up on our YouTube channel when it's ready to go. Uh, but John, I just want to say thank you. We're really excited for your new book to come out and for your upcoming event. And thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you, Christine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye.